Here we go, part three, all steel race 2.3 Pinto. In a moment, we are gonna show you a quick clip of me machining the new pistons for this. Then I'm gonna show you a little Huawei modification we made, checking ring gaps for said pistons. We're gonna talk down the big end bolts using a stretch gauge. Then we're gonna talk about oil pumps and show you our nice shiny new REC valves. And here we have our bridge bolt and milling machine. And on the machine is one of the old pistons used for reference and a new piston in our jig, ready for machining. And before you all ask, this is something I'll only do for engine builds that are done here. It's not a service we offer to the public. And a quick shot of a piston with both valve reliefs machined into it. Anytime you do any engine work with a head off, you really ought to run a tap down the head bolt holes. And make sure the holes are nice and clean, particularly at the bottom where you get the accumulation of junk muck. You know, skimmed head, skimmed block. Bolts might want to go a bit deeper than standard. And especially down the bottom of the holes, you can find the bolt starts to bind up and you're not getting a true torque figure. Likewise, you really ought to do it with the main bearing cap bolts, but as they're in the bottom of the engine, you rarely find any rust or muck in them. This is actually a machine tap intended for a milling machine, but it works just fine for chasing my threads. I'm not worried about blowing any dirt and debris out the bottom of the holes yet. We can do that later when I've took the block back outside into the main workshop. All I want to do right now is make sure the threads are good. You can see there, it started to bind up just before it hit the bottom. Ring gap time. If you're using standard cast pistons, the odds are the gap won't be small. The rings will be pre-gapped on every fine. If anything, standard rings are probably too big gap wise. And at this point everyone goes, oh no, no, too big, too big. It's not an issue. In the tiny fraction of time the combustion process takes, guarantee a fraction big ring gap will make no difference whatsoever to the engine. Forged pistons, the rings are not usually pre-gapped. It's absolutely vital we check them. The real reason is that as the ring gets hotter, it will expand. As it expands, the gap will close up. If the ring ends but and continues to expand, something has to give. The ring will try and bend up and it'll either break the ring land of the piston or it will push so tight against the bore it will try and weld itself on to the bore and then you've got massive bore damage. Absolutely critical, you need to check they're not too tight. In this instance, I'm gonna use an old school rule of thumb, three thou per ridge of bore, 93 mil bore, we're slightly under four inches, but if we call it four inches, three times four, 12 thou. And I'm gonna add a little bit of safety margin, so we're going for 14 thou. We can ignore the oil control rings. Very, very seldom do we ever need gapping. They don't expand the same way. So as long as there's the tiniest gap, they are absolutely fine. Check the gap. All we really need is the ring square in the bore. Obviously, this being a fresh block, it's been rebored. So we can, if we're careful, just pop it in the top. Better though to make sure that the ring is absolutely square because slightly out of square will alter the gap a bit. In this case, I've got piston with some rings on it and I've just pushed it square in the bore. And if that one is anything like the other rings, that is gonna be around 15, 16 thou. 14's loose, that's fine. I'm not gonna worry about that one. The top compression ring will be tight. Square it up. I can already see the gap there's tiny. Six thou, way too small. So now we need to open it up a bit. Or should I say, in the words of Blue Peter, here's one I did earlier. Lovely. Nice snug 14 thou. Perfect. Short and sweet, gentle cuts. That actually took me five or six goes. Just avoid the temptation because there's not much happening. So you take a tiny bit more and then a tiny bit more and then all of a sudden you've took too much. So a big ring gap's not the end of the world, but you want to avoid it if you can. But one last important thing is that when you've ground away at the edge of the gap, sometimes you make a sharp edge there. You can do it with an oil stone or a file. Just take the tiniest bit off. Just shamp that edge the tiniest bit so you don't make a sharp edge. This block has been cleaned to death. It's been acid dipped, it's been washed, it's been from your hot wash several times. It, the galleries have been blown through numerous times. But as I said in the past, one difficult thing for the DIY is getting stuff clean. Most of you may have seen my pipe cleaner trick where I can check crankshaft galleries with pipe cleaners. And another one is oil gallery brushes. They're good through rotting through oil galleries. But if you cut the loop off the end of one, you can put it in a drill. Ideal for double checking. And if you get the drill rotation right, anything in there, will be drawn that way and we'll definitely come up with a drill. Obviously once you're done, you still want to blow some air down there just to make sure you haven't left a bit of bristle or something. For sure, what you don't want to do is leave any shards of something metallic. Valve cutouts in the pistons. They're deeper than the last ones, partly to avoid any chance of valve piston contact, but partly because we're going to try some more radical camshafts in order to try and make the engine rev better. And if we can push the torque higher up the rev range, we make the horsepower number bigger. So here we are, 
bottom end upturned, crank in, rods in, ARP bolts in the big ends. As most of you will know, ARP specify a particular lube, preferably their own, or 30 weight oil, because the thickness of the oil on the threads affects the torque setting. The other way to do the bolts up is by a stretch method, where we measure the length of them, and as you tighten them up, the rod gets longer. What most people do, we'll put a torque wrench on them, torque them up to the required amount, and then check the stretch. I don't bother the torque wrench, I just go for stretch. So we take our gauge, one gauge, which hooks in the top of the bolt and a divot in the bottom, and we zero it. Now I'm going to take a fancy little spanner. We can see the needle move as we took the bolt. And there we go, we've stretched the bolt by six and a half thou. That's the correct torque. This is actually a spare piston for the engine. But when I stripped the old one apart, it was showing signs of wear in there where the pin is. Now the pin, it's only real lubrication it gets, is fed with oil from the oil rail. And there's a little hole there where the oil gets in the oil control ring, goes in through and drops down a hole there inside to lubricate the pin. We've opened that hole up a bit just to encourage a bit more oil to the gudgeon pin. Here's the engine's dry sump pump that I've rebuilt with a couple new seals, but I've also changed the rear rotor we put a bigger, wider one in it, which has answered a question that's been bugging me for a long while. This isn't the first use for this pump. This pump used to live on a two litre race pin tire built, and it worked really well. Didn't do a lot of racing. The owner moved on to do other things. So the pump, when it went on this engine, was still very new. But the only odd thing that always struck me about this is that when you got the oil properly hot, it always seemed a bit slightly short on oil pressure, and I could never find a reason why. Now I have a reason. When I stripped, the oil pump, which is three sets of rotors in it, two to suck the oil out of the sump and put it in the dry sump tank, and a final pressure stage. And this is a stage that actually provides oil to the engine internals. Now the thing with oil pumps is that they're really well lubricated, but they're the only part of the engine that's not filtered. It has raw unfiltered oil going through it. And when I took this pump apart, I could see metallic particles embedded in the rotors, and I thought, I don't like that. So first off, I said to Andy, you need a new dry sump tank. Hayes is a one piece tank, you can't clean it properly. And we don't want metal in the oil pump. I got into my supplier and arranged a new rotor. And what turned up was the answer to why this engine perhaps was slightly short on oil pressure and its predecessor on the same pump was. This is a standard full Pinto oil pump rotor. And as you can see, it's quite a bit wider than one out the race oil pump. And my contact said to me, when Pace designed these pumps, they specified a very marginal size rotor. And I can see that because I don't understand why they put a narrow rotor or narrow than the standard rotor in an engine that actually required more, not less oil pressure. So the oil pump's been rebuilt with bigger rotors. So that should see once and for all the end of any slightly low looking oil pressure readings, when in fact there's nothing wrong with the engine. So therefore there's no obvious reason why the oil pressure should be a bit marginal when the oil's hot. We have now got a nice shiny new set of REC valves, wasted stem, single groove, and the single groove's important because of race engines, triple groove, cotters wear, and they're prone to dropping valves. And these basically are the ultimate of valves. So now we've got valves, we can start work on the cylinder head. The engine used to have a 1600 head. This time I've changed my mind, I'm using a two litre injection casting. Early days for the head, but in the next video clip, you'll see me start to rough out the exhaust ports on our Bridgeport Miller machine. Square ports are a bit of a pain to grind by hand, but the shape beautifully lends itself to the milling table. We didn't get a chance to film me fitting the pistons, but if you want to watch me assemble an engine, click on the link here as I go for a rebuild on Dino Dog.